our final episode of this wild and insane 2021 NHL season is here. And we're going to break down as much as we can all of the free agent moves and other offseason signings and departures that have happened that affect the Montreal Canadiens. It is all here on this edition of Hockey Inside Out. Hockey Inside Out here, Julian McKenzie, your faithful host, alongside at least two-thirds of our usual suspects, Jessica Rusnak of CBC Daybreak Montreal, Stanley Cup champion and former Canadian's assistant coach Rick Green, and tapping in for the vacationing Stu Cowan, Jack Todd from the Montreal Gazette. Jack, thank you so much for filling in for Stu. No problem. Sorry that you just lost half your audience there. But... <laughs> I was about to say half our audience was uh, is probably the first time they've seen you in a walk because you blocked them all. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we're not here to talk about Jack Todd's social media policies. We're here to talk about the Montreal Canadiens and what they do in the offseason. And it's been very busy for them this offseason, especially on the free agent point. Just listing off some of the more prominent names. Mike Hoffman being added to the roster. Uh, David Savard being added, Cedric Paquette, Mathieu Perrault. Um, I'm not missing anyone, am I? Hopefully I'm not missing anybody. Those are all the big names. That's it. They've added all those guys and a few other small depth players as well, uh, re-signing Arturi Lekkinen. The Canadians have been very busy this offseason. So let's get into it. What do you guys think of, of Mark Bergevin's offseason so far? I, uh, I thought probably the best part of his offseason was that he avoided losing a major piece uh, to Seattle. You know, you didn't have to part with Brett Kulak or anybody that was on the on the uh, list of possibles. I had people panicking. Oh my God, why is David Suzuki or why is Nick Suzuki not protected? You know, and you have to say, well, because he's <laughs> still in the first two years. But you know, getting away with only losing Kale Fleury was a, a brilliant move, aided obviously by the injuries to Price and Weber. And, you know, the addition of five new guys, uh, you know, trying to uh, try and improve their hockey club with what's available and, and find guys that want to come to Montreal. And, I mean, I guess somewhat of the good news is with Hoffman being the probably the biggest name that, that comes to mind is he, uh, he spoke of how excited he was to come back uh, into the Canadian market. And obviously time will tell. But, uh, you know, uh, again, you've got uh, – You've got Paquette, you've got Savard, you've got uh, Weidman, you've got you Chris know, Weidman, yes. You've got a you know a number of, of new faces, and it's going to be interesting to see how that uh, fits in the chemistry and you know the success that the Canadians have had uh, in the playoffs last year. But uh, you know, uh, again, it's a tough job. There's only so many names out there, and then obviously there's uh, there's some that don't want to come to this market in Montreal, but. Um, Anyways, Bergeron did the best he could do with, uh, uh, you know, what was available, and we'll see how it plays out. Yeah, there's no big name coming here, but I don't think anyone really expected that. That's not really Mark Bergevin's style to sell the farm to get that one player, but he did do some patchwork by adding some of the depth players, something that Bergevin is known for doing. Uh, David Savard, they needed someone on defense. He's not going to fill the shoes of Shea Weber, but those are huge shoes uh, to fill. And it, there's not really a guy out there that you can get right now to fill those shoes if you don't want to give up a lot for it, but he needed someone there. So that was good that he was able to go out and get uh, David Savard. I don't think anyone's surprised that he was able to add uh, some uh, Francophone players to this roster. A big deal was made when they didn't have a Francophone player in the lineup last year. So I think there was some pressure to go and do that, uh, but he went and got some players that are really excited to return home and play for this team. And uh, that's the good news, that you want the players to be excited and not just signing with you because it's the last resort. Yeah, they really went in on that front. I mean, we mentioned David Savard already, but Mathieu Perrault is an underrated signing for this team. And Cedric Baquette as well. They added some guys who are going to kind of fortify uh, the the bottom six of, of this team. J.S. Dea is also another guy who could kind of go in and out of the lineup, probably get some AHL minutes as well and chris weidman a bit of an interesting one considering he was out of the nhl for a bit playing in in europe and then now comes back he, he may have some offensive upside to him but it's pretty clear he's going to be a deaf guy i'll say this this one last note about savard a lot of people i've, I've seen kind of say that he's not necessarily the best when it comes with his underlying numbers 
But considering he signed under $4 million, they could have made much worse. And Mike Hoffman, I think, is just the easy replacement for Thomas Tatar. And that first line, we remember for the last little while of, of Thomas Tatar, Philip Deneau, who we'll get to in a second, and Brendan Gallagher, obviously going to be looking completely different. And they could at least say, even if Mike Hoffman might be a one-trick pony with the fact that he can get some goals in and, and, and score on the power play and maybe not much else, the Canadians need a guy like that who is or able to score goals. So I think the Canadians have had a pretty good offseason to this point. And even if they end it like this, I mean, I know the division that they're in might be a little tough, but they could have done a lot worse. I still yeah, see them as a playoff team. What Hoffman does to the power play is a huge win. Uh, that, that's been ailing for so long, and now it gives them the possibility to get away from that locked into the two D-men power play, you know, br bring it into the 21st century, and you have a guy who just he just scores. Uh, everywhere he's been, no matter what the situation is, he always puts up those numbers. So he'll, he'll give up some numbers at the other end too. But uh, it, And that the, the wings on offense, the top six, with Drouin returning, Drouin returning might be the biggest – move of the offseason, even though it isn't a move. Because if he comes back healthy and happy, this is going to be a very different team up front. And they're very deep, deep especially on the wings. Yeah. And, and oh, you reckon you're going to add something? Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say about Savard, of course, leaning partial towards the defensive core. <laughs> As you would. Uh, Savard, big guy, 233-pounder. Uh, Bergevin obviously likes that type of uh, – player back there in the blue line saw some success from the other guys that, that play similar to Savard. So I don't know, you know, uh, you don't seem to have enough of those guys uh, over the course of a grinding season and seem to be very effective in, uh, you know, in shoring up uh, a good defensive game with the Canadians. So I, I'm, I'm quite sure he's going to be a, a real good addition and uh, do a good job. And another big body that uh, opposition is not going to like to play against. Uh, one other note about David Savard. Uh, we all remember game five of that Stanley Cup final, ending with one nothing of a scoreline. That's the scoreline that it ended on. David Savard got the assist on the series-winning goal. Uh, let's get to question number two, Philip Deneau. He obviously meant so much to the Montreal Canadiens over the playoffs. We all remember the pizza antics <laughs> after games. I think we're going to miss those here because those were actually particularly fun. But he gets to go to L.A., signing a six-year deal worth $33 million. And it looks as if he may get his wish in terms of getting a role that will allow him to have more offensive responsibilities slotting behind Anze Kopitar in L.A. Do you think the Canadians, though, do you think they should have kept him? Do you think they should have signed him to that same deal that L.A. offered him? Is that too much? Is that just right? What do you guys think of this? Well, for me, I think something happened internally because uh... – there must have been a falling out with the relationship there because I, you know, a French Canadian guy that said he'd love to be here. Uh, I would have thought they would have been able to find a way to get him to, to stay here. And if he thinks he's going to California, he's going to save a lot of money on the tax front. He's, got, you know, he's got a wake up call on, on that. But I, I think, you know, the bottom line, you have to draw the a line in the stand, sand and say, listen, you, your best year was 13 goals, uh, a very good defensive forward offensively. I don't know if he has the capability of, of creating a lot offensively. And to give those type of dollars for a defensive player, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I wasn't a big fan to move forward and get him signed to those big bucks. Uh, but, you know, good for him. It's a decision that obviously was entirely up to him. If he wanted to stay in Montreal, I think he would have found a way. But I think there was something uh, uh, that, that didn't seem to uh, line up with management and himself. And uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, way he goes and you know, hopefully he'll, uh, he'll, he'll better his career. But, uh, you know, again, we'll, we'll see what happens. He'll, he'll be missed, but a defensive uh, – forward uh, those kind of dollars mm, not sure about it yeah i i think it wasn't necessarily the money that was the big factor here it was more as he said he wanted to have more of an offensive role and the montreal canadians couldn't offer him that and the la kings could i also think that he was probably upset with the way things went last year when they were in contract negotiations as he was entering the final year of his contract 
Also, that information between uh, the negotiations between him and the Canadians were leaked uh, to the press as well. I'm sure that was not happy. And I think he was just kind of wanting to see what else the what other NHL teams have to offer with him. And he was probably a little bit hurt by the Canadians and uh, decided to go uh, with the LA Kings instead. And I just don't necessarily know that if it would have been smart for Mark Bergevin to offer that kind of money to Philip Deneau, who's not putting up, you know, 20, 30 goals a season. Yes, he's doing a lot defensively and, you know, shutting down Connor McDavid, as we saw last season. But at the same time, that's a lot of money to give that player. I'm sure uh, Austin Matthews is glad to see the last of him. Uh, he, he's a real plague on on any of these top uh, centermen in the league. Uh, he uh, I, he's as tough as any defensive center I've ever seen, including uh, just Bejeron or Guy Carboneau. Uh It's a big loss. I I wouldn't diminish it, uh, especially coupled with the loss of Weber. Uh, but uh, it, it did go very high. Like just said, I don't think he would have left except he was miffed over the leak on the, the contract negotiations, and they still weren't moving enough for him in, in terms of his role. Uh, now I'm going to miss the guy. He's uh, entertaining, among other things, with his pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, the pizza thing was a really fun thing to see during the playoffs, and it was really interesting to see him go through that last year here, where throughout much of the regular season, a lot of people kind of dogged him for the lack of his offensive abilities, yeah. and no one seemed to care about that in the playoffs once it came time for him to shut down the best players. In this case, guys like Mark Stone, guys like Austin Matthews, the Winnipeg Jets, essentially, and we ran into a tough task with the Tampa Bay Lightning in the Stanley Cup Final, but he really showed his worth as a defensive center. I still don't know what offensive upside he might be able to carry over in L.A., but it looks as if with the way that depth is set up with the Kings – he is going to have to be that number two guy until some of their younger prospects, Quentin Byfield notably among them, start coming up the ranks here. But yeah, I, I'm a bit, you know what, I'm I'm kind of happy for Phil that he's able to get his money elsewhere. He's able to go out in California. You know, obviously we know how great California can be, in particular LA. And also, I, I can't help but think of the difference in, in pressure and markets here. If he's the guy with all that money in Montreal, as soon as he goes on a five, six game goalless drought, you know, the same guy who wants that opportunity to be good offensively, a lot of people are going to start, you know, poking at him in the media. A lot of fans are going to make a slight at him and all that. Yeah. He goes to LA, he goes on a five, six game goalless drought. He probably doesn't really get that much of a mention in Sports Center in the States. Well, so, then, what did LeBron do today? <laughs> yeah, you know, what did LeBron and Westbrook and AD do as the Lakers' big three sets up over there? Oh, I come on, think Julian. Uh, Stephen A. Smith is going to be all over Phillips in <laughs> these six games without a goal. That, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Now that ESPN has the NHL rights, there is a possibility where Stephen A. Smith, for whatever reason, does a whole rant on Philip Deneau. That is possible. I should acknowledge that. But I, I think, you know what, if Phil Deneau was not able to get the money he, was able, he wanted to get in Montreal, because you're right, he did kind of make it known that he would have liked to have stayed here. I don't think going to L.A. is all that bad. I, I think he's in a, in a decent situation. He just has to prove that he's worth all that money and he's able to bring that offensive upside. Because you're right, Rick, 13 goals is your best offensive season in terms of goals that leaves a lot to be desired. Well, and, you know, he was given an opportunity uh, on the offensive uh, side of things. And, you know, everybody was hoping to maybe have something happen there. But uh, he, he doesn't strike me as that type of offensive, uh, creative type of player. It's uh, it's not a, a knock against him. It's just what it is. And like I said, in all fairness, uh, he was given opportunity and, uh, you know, the, the points and the goals and, the great playmaking uh, it didn't really seem to materialize. And they're, they're good. The great two-way centermen, and you played with one of them. Uh, they do deliver at the other end, including Kopitar, where he's going. Bears are on that. They, they're offensive threats, as well, and they somehow can carry both, which he really can't do. I, I don't really see a difference between a goal scored and a goal prevented. But when you can't bring that end of it, I think on a really excellent deep team, he's your number three centerman. So. I have to see. Remember it. Well, I'll give to know this this praise too. That when he was with the Canadians, he was part of a line that was arguably the best at five on five. So if he's yeah. able to translate some of that over to his new line mates in LA, 
Maybe there's some more offense that comes his way, but I'm sure the Kings are at least happy they have a guy who's going to be shutting down some of the best talents in the Western Conference uh, for this coming season. So we spoke about Mark Bergevin's moves to this point, the additions and the subtractions. Do you think he's done at this point? I think for now he's done kind of phase one because as we're entering sort of like the dog days of summer, it's kind of the quiet time right now in the NHL. And I think he also wants to see what the prospects are going to bring at training camp, which is not that far away from now to see which players have matured over the year. And it's probably a little bit difficult too to sort of rate some of these players, especially the junior ones that didn't play uh, or even the ones that were on the Laval Rockets that had a very unique uh, season as well. So I think at this point, He's putting pause on it. He's for sure still taking phone calls and, and seeing what other GMs are willing to, to offer. But I think he wants to see, you know, the prospects in, uh, you know, the pipeline, what they can bring, who's going to come to camp and be that big surprise, that player that everyone's going to be talking about and then reassess from there. Oh, I think he, he needs a puck moving defenseman still. And I think D'Angelo was on the list, and I think he came off the list because of the stink over a certain other move that the Canadians made. And I'm very grateful that he did come off the list because I don't think we really need a guy here who believes that uh, the violent overthrow of the U.S. government is a good idea and who can't seem to get through a practice with his teammates without throwing them and a few other detractions. But if somewhere along the way, uh, Benjamin can come up with a, a guy who can move the puck at the back end, I think that would help. And, and I think this time of year, like Jess said, it, it's kind of quiet. Uh, there's there's not a lot going on, but I think in the back of uh, Bergevin's mind, um, I'm thinking he's, he would love to have an experienced centerman again. He's got a lot of youth down the middle. Uh, many, many times we've talked about the inexperience. Uh, again, without taking away from how good some of these kids are, it would be really nice to solidify with a, an experienced centerman that can uh, really help some of these kids uh, through some, you know, some some areas that uh, you know they need help with. And uh, he's, I'm sure he's he's looking and he's listening. And uh, uh, I don't think he's done yet, but uh, this is this is a quiet time, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, start a training camp. I know that he's putting uh, putting a lot of pressure on uh, a lot of these young kids, and expectations are there. And that's a good thing, and you'll get a pretty good reading real quick as far as what you know whether or not they'll be able to uh, handle themselves as well as what they did in the playoffs. Uh, before I mention a name that uh, has kind of popped up in circles over the last few days, and I still think the Canadians might be on just personally. I don't have any intel, but it's just like a gut feeling. Uh, Jack did mention Tony D'Angelo. I think he was asked about whether or not he did actually support the insurrection. He did tell the media that he didn't. So I, I just want to put that out there because that's what he was asked, I think, after he signed in Carolina. And he said he did not. Just in case, you know, someone writes in the comments, you know, hey, that's not actually true. We just need to cover our bases here. Um, Jack Eichel is the name that still has not moved from Buffalo uh, he wants, uh, you know, the next surgery. He wants that artificial disc in his neck. There is some controversy about the surgery, but he also wants out of Buffalo. And the Canadians, off of some reports that have kind of floated around there, it seems as if they've at least shown some interest in the center. I'm just curious: would, are any of you, if you were all Mark Bergevin, it would, are you, are any of you interested in trading for Jack Eichel, knowing the price is at least? what, four first-round picks or the equivalent of four really good assets for this player? Is that the number one centerman this team needs? Absolutely not. Uh, I'm 100% against Steichel. He's never wow. been able to move the, the needle in Buffalo. And it's, it's a, a phrase I coined for myself, basically. Is this guy a move-the-needle player? Does he come in and change your team? And I call, he, he wasn't able to do that in the place where he was. You know why Tim Murray's face was so black when he didn't win that lottery for McDavid, because there was a huge gap there between number one and number two. And when I look around, even much better centermen than he is have not been able to move their teams forward at playoff time, Matthews and McDavid being the two most significant 
examples. So the Canadians have something really good going here in terms of their internal chemistry. And some of it, much of it is built around those young centermen, beginning with Suzuki. And I think he would have to be part of any package to bring Eichel to Montreal. And at that point, I just say, forget it, forget it. It's, it's, and I don't understand this long drawn out process of his injury status. And, you know, uh, one says this, the other one says that, he says this. It's just like this, this kind of stuff shouldn't be happening uh, with, with anybody, let alone one of your star guys. And I don't know, uh, you know, the insides of it, other than there's obviously concern about his, his health moving forward, that he has an issue here that, uh, they're not sure how to get it back to 100%. And that's a big concern. And I don't know whether this is playing into uh, some of the uh, question marks that other teams are having when it comes down to a guy that has not been healthy and has something that could be possible, I don't know, career ending or something that's going to uh, haunt him for his career. And uh, I don't know what uh, what the end result will be other than I hope the, the kid, uh, who's obviously very, very talented, gets himself straightened out so that uh, he can go and play the game that he loves. But right now there's a lot of uncertainty in his, his health and, and you know, what, what degree of severity this, this actual injury is that he does have. Yeah, it really is quite the soap opera down in Buffalo right now with Jack Eichel. But I wonder if this will help other teams. And the longer he's there, everyone knows Jack Eichel does not want to be there and he has to be moved, that the value might go down, that they might say, you know what, instead of wanting – you know, two first round picks, we'll do one first round pick and, you know, uh, a younger kind of player like a yes, Barry Cockneyemi. And then you could look at it and say, is this, is this worth it? But I think the value for the trade is going to start to go down because as you get closer to the beginning of the season, then it's, you know, is he going to report to camp? What's going to happen with him? Buffalo is going to want to get something for him. So it's kind of one of those situations that you have to wait and see and see, uh, you know, if the price starts to go down, if he gets moved, maybe not to the 50% off rack, but maybe there might be a 20% <laughs> off sale or they'll pay both the taxes. <laughs> if they get him for Logan Mayu, I'm all for it. Oh boy. <laughs> um, and I'm also curious about some of the teams who might have been in on a Jack Eichel. I'm looking at a team like L.A. I was a team early in this offseason. I thought, OK, they'd be in on, on a Jack Eichel. They might flip Quinton Byfield the other way, among other assets. Are they willing to do that now after all the money they shelled out to, for Philip Deneau? Is Vegas interested in, in in getting a Jack Eichel? Minnesota just bought out uh, uh, Zach Parise and, and Ryan Suter. And they kind of have to find a way to compete now. But if they add a Jack Eichel, what's their salary cap going to look like in two, three years when they have to accommodate for both of those salaries they bought out? Are the Rangers, they've been adding all of these other pieces, are they in on it? I look at a team like Montreal who's just been quietly adding players here and there. They have assets, I think, if they were willing to make a Jack Eichel trade. But you're right, a deal for Jack Eichel would have to involve a Nick Suzuki. It might even have to involve a Cole Caulfield. It might even have to involve a Matthias Norlander and and some pretty big assets that this team may not necessarily want to part with. That being said, if Mark Bergevin really wants that number one center, you're going to have to give to get. But considering how long this process has been drawn out, and by the way, Jack Eichel's agents literally put out a statement saying the process is not working, the longer this draws out, the more likely you might not have to give up a Nick Suzuki. You might just have you might just be okay giving up a Yasperi Kakanyemi for two first round picks. And an and a B prospect at this rate. Who knows? But you know, we're gonna have to see how this plays out. Maybe we end up doing an emergency episode of Jack Eichel becomes a member of the Montreal Canadiens. Who knows? And he's Who knows? a ten million dollar price tag for the next four years. That too, but that's also for a young center still who hasn't entered his prime. You know, like I mean, I get ten million. I mean, the Canadians are already paying ten million dollars to a goaltender uh who you could argue is past his prime. I think fans, or at least I, at least the way I see it, it's a little easier to stomach paying ten million dollars for a center who is still en route to reaching his prime. That being said, the next surgery does change a lot of things with this team. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has any other thoughts they want to add on Eichel or offseason stuff or or Jack Todd. If you have any other, I know you're not on often, so. You know, any opportunity you get to make any other snarky comments, you feel feel free to do so before we close. I, I don't really have opinions on things, so. Uh. <laughs>
Thank you again for filling in for Stu. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, uh, Rick, as well, for being on this episode. And this is our last one uh, up until training camp. Uh, I know Stu's not here, but uh, I'm sure he'd say thank you to the fans as well. Thank you to everyone who tuned in this year uh, and, and being patient with our, our setup online, obviously, due to COVID. We were put in the situation where we had to kind of do this virtually. Who knows what it'll look like for next season? Maybe we're back in the studio. Who knows? Maybe we'll all have to wear masks or something. Who knows? Uh, but uh, I'm excited for whatever the next season will look like. I was really happy to to be in the host chair uh, for this year. It was really cool to do. A uh, big shout out to the production team as well for setting up the episodes and making sure everybody was on point. Dave Peters, as always. Uh, Jeff Blonde also stepping in for, for Dave whenever Dave can't be in. And again, the fans at home watching our episodes uh, from the beginning of the season to now. Thank you all so much for watching us. Thank you all so much for subscribing to the YouTube channel and visiting HockeyInsideOut.com to watch our full episodes, which you can do uh, once this episode is over. And be sure to be on the lookout for bonus episodes as they come throughout the week. Uh, for everyone, I just want to say thank you again for watching Hockey Inside Out for this season. And we'll be back in time for training camp. Peace.